Well, let's get started. Um, welcome everybody to our August meeting. Um, first of all, I want to thank the New Jersey Antique Radio Club for sponsoring us and uh, providing the Zoom feed. Um, Dave, I think probably everybody on knows it, but say it anyway. Yeah, just uh, let's all behave and uh, it's uh, it's worthwhile. Keep your microphones on mute unless you have a specific question to uh, to ask. And uh, that's about all I got to say. <laughs> OK, um, I give a brief museum report before we ask new people to introduce themselves, get more people to, time to uh, get online. Um, we now have 205 members, finally passed the 200 number. Um, I think we had 165 last year. So uh, significant growth. Um, second thing I want to mention, we've all already talked about a little bit, and that's the newsletter that um, Mike Molar and Robert Ring um, have graciously volunteered to do. It's wonderful. Um, We've gotten, we have a separate email address for that. I've been reading the comments that have been coming in. And so far, nothing but compliments and, and good ideas for uh, uh, for Mike and Robert for, for future ones. The newsletter, what we decided to do is it's available when it comes out to members only. And we have a um, sort of a promo version on the website for non-members. Uh, which we've publicized. Um, the idea is that when the next one comes out, we'll put the last month's edition on the website for everybody to see. And that way everybody eventually get to see it, but a perk of being a member is that you get to see it a month earlier. Again, thanks very much. It's a tremendous addition to the, uh, to the museum. We really appreciate it. Next thing I want to talk about is the sweepstakes. Um, we're doing okay, and it's really hard to tell how we're doing. I unfortunately haven't kept uh, records. I should do this week by week from each year to see how ticket sales occur. Um, we have a little over a month to go before the closing date, which is October 4th. Um, and we're about 80% of the way to... Um, the $8,000 minimum level to award the prize. So I don't know how we're doing. It feels slow, but I know a lot of the purchases come in in the last couple of weeks, and I'm hope, hoping the same thing happens uh, hope this year. So if you haven't gotten tickets, get them. Tell your friends to get them. It's a great prize. Uh, the final thing I want to mention is the fall swap meet. Um, it's going to be October 12th. Um, we're also going to have a work day. Several people um, have volunteered to come in Friday and help with some projects that we've got. Um, we've got a lot of CRTs that we need to put up top. Um, we have the hoist now that makes that an easy job, but it still takes manpower. And I think we're going to have attempt to rip up the carpet in that first area of the post-war room and strengthen the floor underneath where the telejuke is so that it doesn't look like it's gonna fall on you when you walk walk in there. Um, I think I figured out a fairly simple way to do it if we have a, have a little manpower. So if you have any, if you're available um, Friday before the swap meet, um, please show up. They'll be there people early in the morning. So anytime you show up will be helpful. Uh, the Prize is going to be awarded. Uh, the grand prize is going to be awarded, assuming we reach the 8,000 level. Can't imagine we won't reach the 8,000 level. Just a question of how much above that we go. So that's all I've got on the museum. Anybody have any questions or comments? Yeah, I want to say bravo for the newsletter. It's just wonderful. And I do. I do have a suggestion. If the file name could be uh, ETF newsletter instead of just newsletter, I'd be less likely to lose it. <laughs> okay. I think we can change that. <laughs> hey, Steve. Um, uh, Mike and Robert are actually prepared to do a um, a, a presentation as part of tonight's meeting. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. 
Fantastic. A, a very short one. Fantastic. We'll do that when we uh, uh when we get the to the uh um the main event. Yeah, more like an a focus group just to make sure we're doing the right things. That, that's a great idea. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Well, then let me ask if there's anybody new that hasn't been in the meeting before or hasn't been here for quite a while. Um, want to introduce yourself? Now's the time to do it. Well, old timers, I guess. Let me move on to um, the uh, to Larry, and um, what we're going to be what I'm going to be talking about tonight um, is um, relates to mechanical television. I'm going to be dealing with the Davin equipment that we have. Um, Davin was a manufacturer mainly of of of, of uh, well, of radios and of audio um, components back in the 20s. And they decided to go into the television business and produced a number of products. And we've been lucky enough to get um, a bunch of them for, uh, for the museum. First thing I want to focus on is their discs that they made and sold. Um, we have uh, several of them, and here are two. Um, the bottom one is just a standard... Um, um, a standard disc with, I think, um, 24, very early ones with 24 holes, 24 lines. Uh, you can see the size of the holes. They're pretty, uh, um, they're, they're pretty big. And this is the most primitive um, of the mechanical systems. This is available in, 19, in 1925. Most of their equipment was available in 1928, but through about 1930. The second disc we have is the uh, one above it, which is um, um, has three sets of, of, of holes in it. And it was designed for uh, the receiver that I'll show you in a minute, or the scanner that I'll show you in a minute. And this was um, had three sets of, uh, of scanning discs. On the outside is, um, a, um, is a 48 line ring of, of holes then 36 lines, and then on the, the inner one is, is 24 lines. And this disc went in the um, Davin tri-standard receiver, um, which is, um, Larry, if you can focus in on it. Yeah, there it is right there. Um, this was available either uh, there, there were instructions that were published in Popular Mechanics in 1929. Um, uh, you could also buy it as a uh, pre-built assembly from Davin. But uh, Larry, open it up and um, um, you can see it has a disc in it and um, you can't see it, but behind the disc is a neon lamp holder that could be moved up or down. Maybe, uh, probably not, doesn't matter. But uh, that's sort of a picture of it. Um, you can move it up or down to put it behind one of the three sets of, uh, of scanning holes. And then similarly on the front cover, close it again, Larry, well, you can see the three holes in the cover there. Um, yeah, right there. You can move the viewing hood to one of those three positions. Uh, and this way you could watch, yeah, you can see how it would go from one to the one to the other. And this way you could watch any of the, those three uh, those three standards. Um, the plans were available for 15 cents. Um, this one was it came from Cincinnati. Um, and I believe it was home built, but I don't know uh, I don't know for sure. There on the side, you can see the motor speed control. Uh, no synchronization on this. Uh, you just um, kept your hand on that to make it um, uh, to keep the picture more or less in, in synchronization. Now, Davin also made um, uh, neon bulbs. And I don't know, Larry, scan up to the 
where those neon bulbs are showing up there. Yeah, you see on the end there, there's a Na Davin box. Um, the neon for it is in the uh, scanner, but that's the box it came in, uh, and it was a four prong um, neon. Um, and uh, it was a little bit smaller than the than the standard um, um, than the standard um, uh, the larger the ones that were made for Baird and so forth, but a similar and similar design. Now another thing they made was a um, an amplifier. Um, There it is right there. They made this in a three and four tube version. The, this is resistance coupled. Um, and the advantage of that was that it didn't have the, it had a greater bandwidth than the, a transformer coupled amplifiers. So it was ideal for television. Um, the first two were um, pre-amplifier tubes and in the three tube amplifier, uh, the last tube was a, um, um, driver for the neon tube. Uh, the four ver the four tube version had two drivers in parallel to handle larger uh, larger neons. These were sold to experimenters, and they were used for um, uh, for people who are building their own uh, their own uh, their own uh, TV sets. And the final thing I want to talk about is this receiver that's behind it. Um, we got this also from Cincinnati. Um, this was available as a kit or uh, as a, um, a um, factory built unit. Uh, it's a TRF receiver with, with three uh, stages. And then it has a, um, um, it has one of the, one of the, the uh, Davin amplifiers to drive, in this case, a four tube version to drive the, uh, the neon tube. Um, now this, as a project several years ago, we um, bought a, one of those cheap AM radio broadcast kits because this tunes the broadcast band. This was before the two megahertz television band. It was introduced in 1928. And um, successfully transmitted pictures from the um, Western Visionette next to it. Um, through that AM radio transmitter to this receiver. Um, and uh, we were actually able to, uh, and then we connected the output of the receiver. It, I said, hey, we, we, I'm saying this, I'm saying this wrong. We connected the output of the receiver to the visionette and the input came from our computerized um, um, video signal for, uh, for, for 60 line television. And it worked. Um, we didn't use the batteries. The batteries are just dummies in there. We had built a uh, AC power supply, uh, but this originally had A and B batteries to drive the uh, to drive it. So that's the the um, the the Davin equipment we have. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? I'd like to uh, throw in something about the Davin tubes. Yes. I had a chance to uh, look up specs on, on the O1A tubes uh, that were typically used in those radios. And they also listed the Davin tubes, and, and they were they were a little beefier both in current and in gain than you could get on, uh, on any of the uh, typical radio tubes you'd buy at the time. Like gain, Thank of, you. instead of eight, as a gain, you might have had 10. Um, and and then the, the better current driver for the neon tube. Steve, I have one question. Yeah. Now, did any of these companies like Davin or Hollis Baird, et cetera, ever really make a profit with uh, mechanical television? And a related question is, did any of them try to go into electronic uh, TV? Well, I think um, the answer to your first question is probably nobody did um, make a profit. Um, they, um, I don't think the quantities sold were very large. 
RCA, of course, started with mechanical television, not selling them, but making them, um, and then went into electronic TV. Um, and um, I think really that's the only only company I can think of that 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 went into electronic TV. I I guess Jenkins or Sanabria rather at one point was um, had some sort of a relationship with Farnsworth, and I don't know if it went anywhere. Um, and Sanabria did make television receivers way later in the you know in the fifties. In Anybody their, else have any knowledge? Yeah, of that? in their last days, Hollis Baird um, uh, had electronic television. I think it's there's a few lines about it in one of the articles on the ETF website, but uh, but they did get that far before going bust. Thank you very much. General Electric went on to electronic television. Um, Beard, right. dear Baird in England did experiments with it, but by then the uh, Borg had ousted him, so he was just doing it experimentally during uh, World War II. Uh, Sanabria uh, started the American television after the uh, fall of uh, Western television. Western television uh, had had bought um, uh, Echophone to make its sets, and then Echophone, uh, when uh, Clement Wade, uh, who was the president of Western television, when he got out of it, he sold Echophone and it became Halicrafters, of course, not related to television at that point. Um, so uh, Sanabria's American television was making in the, the students were making uh, CRTs out of flash. And they got so good at it that they started selling to the Army uh, and Navy during uh, World War II for uh, oscilloscopes and radar tubes. And uh, after uh, World War II, um, Sanabria got out of the, uh, the school and, and used, the, used the technology that he developed for CRTs and started to force Sanabria television, which was making CRT televisions. Pretty interesting stuff. Also the tubes um, that I've seen in the uh, popular electronics, the 1928 uh, article in popular uh, mechanics, actually it was, uh, the, the Mu-20s uh, were the uh, preamplifier tubes and the Mu-6 was the output tube and uh, they made it so you could, uh, the Davin amp was like a breadboard where you could substitute out the resistors. You could just clip the resistors in and on the bottom, you could screw in the capacitors. So it was a wonderful breadboard for making television circuits um, or maybe other, other circuits as well. Uh, there were a couple of uh, competing brands too, if I remember right, Murad I think had one. Um, it was a marvelous idea and not quite as flexible as the uh, plug-in uh, boards that we have, the plug boards that we have today, but but along those lines, I think Richard Dean once told me that there was a four ver four tube version of the Davin amp that instead of having the parallel output tubes, um, it just had four uh, tubes, and the and the first tube was an extra preamp tube in case uh, you used a different detector uh, on the input that that inverted it would reinvert the uh, signal. So um, those are some interesting side side lines. Thank you for all for this uh, for this great additional information. Um, anybody else have comments? Oh, also, you said that the uh, the output on your experiment uh, into the uh, Sanabria set, the Western set, was uh, sixty lines. I believe it was forty five lines uh, triple interval. I'm sorry, you're you're correct. I, I <laughs> my mistake. Yes, it was forty five yeah. lines. I thought that was a wonderful experiment. By the way, I, I, it, that impressed me a lot. Things like that are fun to do. And yeah, that Davin amp is so flexible. It was it was genius. It's absolute genius. I think somebody, I think a large corporation bought out Davin, but I can't remember who it was. It might have been Raytheon or, or ITT. What, what were the other uses of that Davin amplifier other than television? Well, gosh, you could use that to uh, as a resistance couple amplifier fire for uh, anything that was a little bit more broadband than even just regular uh, radio reception. It would be just a just a base for experimentation. Um, it was fabulous. Yeah, I, I had... think that uh, that nineteen twenty six twenty eight time was still when the uh, the audio output on uh, radios was so weak that uh, to to do an outboard amplifier. Would uh, would drive a couple of speakers or whatever 
because uh, if you remember, radios at that time didn't have volume controls. They were just going for all they could get uh, out of the out of the sets. Hmm. And a lot of speakers. Same, yeah. Is this the same Davin that made step attenuators that are used in audio consoles back in the fifties and sixties? Uh, I was just wondering uh, if, if if that's how it emerged, because they were the kings of the attenuators that broadcast consoles used. Yeah, I'd be interested to see if they were in Newark, New Jersey, because that's where this Davin yeah. was. Yeah, it's the same company because they may actually they made step attenuators back in the in the, uh, in the at the same time they were making this TV stuff. Well, okay, well they, they were the best. I, I mean, considered to be the best, and uh, mm -hmm. I mean ones that were built back in the '40s and '50s still work just fine today. A real mechanical marvel and easy to fix if, if something goes wrong. They were expensive though. They had their own resistors called dav ohms too. <laughs> Fixed resistors. I forgot that, but that's true. I think it's an old Jewish family. I mean, it's the word Nadavan means pray. <laughs> they were smart to find a niche. The only problem was as soon as they came out with the uh, three, the tri standard <laughs> disc, we had 60 line television and it blew the whole thing away. It was, uh, it was too bad. Yeah, I'm not sure if they ever made a 60 line disc. Oh, I I don't remember. I don't think they did. I, I, I never, I've never seen one. You wonder it wouldn't fit in the cabin, of course. Uh, Steve, you mentioned you weren't sure about the cabinet on the one in the museum. Yeah, I, I believe um, the the um, nation's capital radio television museum has one that that I believe is original, and there's like a shaft that comes out the top so that you could pull the tube up to the right level for the window you're looking at then you only need one window too because you right you can move everything around so uh i think theirs is an original and i think yours yours is a uh homemade okay i have one that does got no cabinet at all that's that's a bit of a challenge does that do you know if the the uh, popular mechanics plans um included that um hole in the top no, I don't. Yeah, I don't think that I don't think that's in that popular uh, mechanics plan. I've seen yeah. that repeated. I think that was in um, either radio news or tele television news. Also, the same plans. I'll take a look. No, it does not show a uh, hole in the top. Anybody else have any uh, information to add? Well, then let's go on to um, our, um, let's have uh, Mike and Robert um, do their presentation and um, um, focus group and and then from there, we could go into um, this general discussion of things. Sure. Uh, I'll start and then turn it over to Robert. Um, we're pleased with the response, like you said, that uh, we've gotten so far from people. And, um, and, and some of the ideas we've been given, too. And depending on how much uh, feedback and, and input we get from members, uh, some of the topics that, that were listed on the first page um you know they might appear Robert, periodically um we're pleased with the response like what is, is this something breaking up here can you hear me yep okay um so i think only one at a time can can talk or are we mixing it up am i have i faded out uh, no, you're you're good. I heard something coming through, some noise in the background. It sounded like an echo, yeah. Only your mic and Robert's is on right now, so let's okay. see what happens. So uh, anyway, we're happy with the feedback we've gotten from people and some some good ideas to start, and um, and I, I'm glad that people are seeing it. Our goal is going to be to put it out like a week before the Zoom meeting, so it, it'd be like an early warning that a, a Zoom meeting's coming up, and then Dave, you can do your uh, later in the week, uh, warning or message to people too. 
And um, and like I said, some of the topics that are that are listed, I'd like to get a lot of that to be feedback from uh, from other members. And it could be uh, feedback that's only a couple of sentences. It, you know, if it's something like a, uh, I suggested the idea of um, my family's first color TV kind of thing. So if you only have two sentences about it, if you send me those, we might get about, you know, a half a dozen responses from people and put those all in a short letter. But uh, things that, um, you know, just bring back some memories, uh, the, the first collected collectible TV that you got, that kind of thing. One thing while, um, well, is Larry still on? Um, if, if he's not, maybe Steve, you could tell him uh, that one of the suggestions I got from Dave I Arlen. I am still here. Okay. One of the suggestions Dave Arlen uh, gave is to have you take some pictures of people visiting the museum and get some, uh, you know, responses of uh, the happy faces looking at things. And, and we could include those in a newsletter sometime too. We could look into that. Good. You know, uh, anything you supplied, um, you know, you just tell the people it's going to a newsletter, I think would be, if they object, then just don't use it. Of course. And then, uh, and then if someone, when the uh, swap meet comes to get us some, outdoor pictures there too and uh um and we'll be going into the the bank of uh pictures from previous conventions uh, to get something to put on uh down the road too um for a I think while it'd be yet... nice to get some pictures of some members of the museum as well uh like uh just you know regular members and feature them as well yeah i'm planning to do that like we did the the little piece about ed Ritan. Uh, so I'm going to be pestering some people down the road um, to to give me, a, you know, some information so that I could write a little bio about them. And some of these guys have had really interesting careers that I'd like to uh, let the rest of the members know about. You know, even when you do that tear up of the carpeting or when you're putting those CRTs away, anything like that that shows the activities that the museum is engaged in are, are valuable things. So I don't know if any if anyone has any ideas they want to throw at us right now, or certainly that uh, that email is going to be out there that you could um, send us uh, any suggestions you have or uh, comments about things that we have done. If anyone sees some, you know, going through some old literature and you see those little comics that were kicked in once in a while, take a, a snapshot of uh, little uh, comics in maybe an early television magazine or something. That uh, that we can include in the uh, in the newsletter too would be good. Mm -hmm. Little filler things that that would help out. So let's see. So you know who is uh, what we'd like to do is get your input. It's going to be what you make it in the end. So if we get a lot of input, then it's going to look like a really lively, uh, involved thing. But uh, you've got to tell us what you want to see, what you liked, what you don't like, and uh, what can you contribute to this. I know a lot of you tell great stories when we're here and all we need to do is transfer that into some type stuff and they'd, they'd be wonderful things to share so any ideas or suggestions well before you start steve i have to say that that tv set in back of you it back of your shoulder is the most unique set i've ever seen before especially with well, those little balls hanging down i've never seen a set like that before multi-level television yeah i never quite see one like that well, it, it has some it, it it has more entertainment value than than mechanical television did <laughs> um, when there are a couple of cats on it. Uh, so so who's interested in seeing what? Let's talk about it a little bit. <laughs> well, I can tell you that I have a uh, a pretty large inventory of uh, photos uh, from the uh, from the earlier conventions and I'll, uh, I'll I'll make make that accessible to both of you guys so you can uh, you know pick and choose from that and um, and I also have a pretty vast inventory of uh, technical publications from the uh, David Sarnoff library which you might be interested in uh, poking peeking at to see what uh, if there's anything yeah, that'd be great. That you can use. I also have a bunch of pictures from various events that have been at the museum um, over the years that I'll make available to you. That'd be wonderful. Those, that's good. 
we're telling the history of the museum at the same time. And we want to make sure that we have as much as we can. People need to see where you've been and where we're going. So who else has some ideas? Well, we're going to keep checking our uh, emails to see what you guys come up with. The, um, you know, it, we're we're learning too as we go along. In fact, we can't get the emails picked up on Robert's computer yet. Still not. So, so I'll forward <laughs> any any good <laughs> messages to him as we try to get our technical act together too. But uh, but anyway, we're happy with the product we put out, and we're happy with the uh, the response from uh, the members that we've seen so far. Are you able um, to show Robert? any of it for any anybody who hasn't seen it yet? Yeah. Excuse the, me. Um, do, you, do you have any any of it on a on a screen shareable format that? Oh, the uh, newsletter. Yeah. Uh, everybody would have gotten an email with it. Everybody so far, would have. So I didn't, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Except except for Dave, I guess. Hey, Robert. Um, contact yeah. me if you still if you still can't get on that. the 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 emails that come with our website are 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 difficult for some browsers uh, for some client email clients to deal with okay i will i will because i'm definitely i mean <laughs> i i have spent as many hours as mike spent putting some of these pieces together i probably spent as many and have not <laughs> been able to get it however i did open another account for myself that i didn't really want <laughs> so, <laughs> so yes absolutely okay <laughs> okay i will thanks steve yeah. <laughs> So I guess that's it for us. So back to you guys. Yeah. Well, thank you guys again. Really appreciate this. This is one of the best things that's happened to the museum in a long time. Um, well, now let's just open it up for general discussion. Anybody got any topics they want to bring up? Go ahead and start talking. I was curious about the TV sets. And the, from the 1920s, and and what was there to actually watch? What was actually on the air? I mean, just Felix the Cat, or what? What was the motivation, or how many hours in the day could they actually stare into that thing? What was its context? Uh, I can add some to that, Steve. Can you? Yeah. Am I coming in? Yeah. yeah, go right ahead. Um, one of the, the examples is uh, Jenkins, when uh, he was actually broadcasting what were supposed to be small dramatic plays. And they found out because of the uh, resolution that they could get, that they did what they called shadow uh, movies. So the uh, the actors would be, let's see, there there would be the camera, a white sheet, uh, and the actors and then a bright light behind them, and it would be projected. So their shadows were on the screen that, that actually um, Jenkins took the pictures of, and they said that that gave enough detail that you could pretty much follow what's going on, like uh, one guy is going to hit the other guy, or you know, some movement on the screen actually made sense. But otherwise, uh, from what I understand, most of the uh screenshots would have to be like just a full face uh, reading uh, reading a news report or something like that uh i understood that uh idaho state did some kind of a, a regular broadcast of someone just reading the news or, or some some information like that but otherwise uh that was the downfall that uh, pretty much um one of the stories is that um rca put together their best um mechanical system in a theater in in manhattan uh they they had their uh experimental station going and they set up their cameras and a, a projector on stage and david sarnoff came with a group of executives and he, he was gonna this was where they had their final chance to impress him that it was worth trying commercial mechanical tv and the the guy uh that was the engineer for it was quoted in this book and he said uh, he looked through the curtains he saw them watching the performance what and gauged their reaction the show went, ended they walked out and he took all the equipment and threw it in the trash outside the building so you know at, at a point they knew it just wasn't going to do it anymore so uh, 
what was seen was just very low grade entertainment if at all and then uh moving characters and uh very simple stuff there was um the, the most i guess famous mechanical broadcasting um was uh, what GE did in Schenectady with the Queen's Messenger, which was a, um, um, I think it was done with, I think at that time they went to 48 lines and they, it was a, it was a fairly elaborate production with several cameras. Um, it was the first drama in the US at least um, that was broadcast on television. Baird also broadcast, had a, had a regular schedule of programming in England um, and it consisted of things like, um, you know, it was maybe an hour a night or something like that. I don't remember precisely now, but it consisted of things like dancers and singers and, and so forth. Um, and um, Mike mentioned uh, Iowa State. They did an extensive amount of programming. Um, and one of the things I read is that um, they use the audio in many cases to tell people what they were seeing because the picture quality, the resolution was so poor, it was often not possible to tell what it was. Um, so you can see it just really was experimental. Um, they were trying to figure out if there was anything they could do with it. And I think they very quickly concluded that, that um, it wasn't practical. Um, as an entertaining me entertainment medium, but you know the hope was at that time that you know they'd gone from twenty four to sixty lines. Uh, why couldn't they go to one hundred and twenty lines, which they did, and maybe to three hundred lines? And if you could do that, you could have a real, uh, real television uh, entertainment service. In fact, Don Lee. Um, with his station in Los Angeles, one of the pioneers on the West Coast, actually had a 300 line mechanical scanner. It was for film only. Um, it's a monstrosity that had the, 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 the disc had to, I think it was about six feet in diameter and had to be in a vacuum, but they were able to scan movies and, um, and, and, and televise them. Um, and, you know, that, so I think everybody hoped that it would get to that point Never did, of course, um, and electronic television came along after that. Okay. The the math was against them. The uh, to get more lines, you had to make smaller holes. The smaller the holes, the less light you could get in, and the, eventually the numbers just weren't going to work. Didn't they cut that. some? Uh, didn't they cut some audio discs that have? Uh, Era, early mechanical television recorded on them that we can still see today? There are audio discs um, from England. That's what uh, Don McLean's uh, uh, excellent book was. They were able to restore those so that you could actually see the images. I find them pretty terrible, but um, they are images. Unfortunately, they're at uh, 3.9 frames per second on a 78 RPM record. And so the flicker would have been terrible. And uh, it is from the uh, reproductions that, that uh, I've seen from Don McLean. Uh, he had to computerize, uh, uh, com computerize and digitize those recordings to get anything out of them. Baird didn't use them for that. He used uh, uh, the phonovision, which is what he called it, um, uh, as uh, to show the, the different sounds that people's faces would make. The reason why was because he wasn't able to reproduce it with all of the linkages and so on and the distortions in the image. And the fact that he was using disc scanning at that point, he, he later switched to uh, drum scanning for his television programs from England. But there were uh, valid ways of using low definition television <clears throat> as they had in the, uh, the Western television system. Uh, Edgar Felix goes into detail about different subjects that were just fine to transmit, like a stand up comedian, for example, where it's a, a head and shoulders situation anyway. And you can see people have reproduced some of this stuff and it looks good if you're just showing a face um, uh, extreme close-ups, but if you're showing um, a body, like they were showing, uh, Sanabria did experiments with uh, tennis lessons where the uh, teacher was showing how to swing the tennis racket. Uh, when you get to the whole body view, and even on a 45 line picture, it's like looking at somebody a block away. Uh, so you're gonna see basically uh, the body, you can't see the fingers, you can't see the details of the face. Um, it didn't work as well. Um, 
but yeah, for 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 just uh, somebody drawing cartoons, for example, they had that was a show that they frequently did at W9XK. And by the way, it was Iowa City, not Iowa State. Um, University of Iowa uh, once had the word state in the name SUI. They called it. It was SWSUI when I worked at the station, but that was University of Iowa and Iowa City, not not at, at Ames. Um, anyway, we we uh, our our station that was there maybe uh, thirty years before I was working there. Um, it had uh, weekly shows on television and it was, you know, professors would give lectures, Boy Scout and Girl Scout lectures. And they would show campfires that somebody illustrated with charcoal um, on, a, on a piece of paper. They had art lessons. Um, anything that a professor would be, be lecturing, they would do lectures. Uh, in Chicago, they had a cartoonist. They had an announcer that did Amos and Annie, Hal Totten. Uh, he was also the announcer for Amos and Andy and he, would, he was uh, one of their celebrities. Uh, but be, be, you also have to remember with mechanical television it is not they're not all the same. Uh, the difference between 24 lines and 32 times, uh, 32 lines is twice the resolution. When you get up to 60, it's it's many times the resolution. So you could you could actually show a uh, a baseball diamond from above with 60 line television, although the picture would the, 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 the picture in the game would be just just a few dots. And the runners would be barely barely visible, but you could see the diamond clearly, and uh, that translates in a more practical way to the idea that you could show uh, two actors, for example, on the screen. If you were in the United States, if you were in England, they had a vertical format um, because they were thinking of, of of the best way of showing one person's face, and um, it, it just the way that the format of um, of a cell phone is today. Um, but that wasn't practical for television where you want to show relationships between people. So when they went to 60 lines, you could show two people on there. That was a breakthrough because now you could have dialogue. Um, the Queen's Messenger, uh, to get with 48 lines, I think it was 48. Um, you, they had uh, one, two, they had th at least three cameras because um, they wanted to show one for the, uh, the male who is an uh, American spy and one for the female who was the Russian spy, that was the facial uh, pictures. And then they had um, two more people sitting at a table and they would use them for hand models because they had hand props like a, a, a pistol for the female actress to point at the male actress and for the poison drink that she fed to the male actor that uh, eventually killed him at the end of the play. Um, and, and that was effective. The, the uh, director uh, directed the whole thing with a baton uh, like a uh, like in a, a concert, and he also was the switcher. Uh, he had a little switching unit, and um, <clears throat> they had another room where, for reporters that could watch the uh, the show. It was basically uh, for publicity, as many of these things were. But people as far away as the West Coast had had seen the images because it was on the short waves, and uh, so there were there were applications for mechanical television. Another thing about mechanical television and narrowband television in general. Uh, is the signal is much less noisy than a wide uh, a, a wider signal for like for for uh, uh, electronic television would be. Um, so there are there are other uses for for low resolution images like that, but for for hands and faces it's just fine. In fact, I've been wishing that there were a way to uh, to to put across my image for this club as a mechanical television image. I have to think about that some more. Well, that's it for me. I'd like to like to mention one more um, mechanical system. <laughs> the um, Scoffany system in England was developed um, before the war, um, and it was 405 lines. Um, in fact, it was used to receive the <laughs> British Broadcasting uh, 405 line standard and continued after the war. Um, it was um, had all kinds of problems, but you know it required very very precise signals, and the BBC wasn't transmitting what they were transmitting had jitter in it, and that sort of um, made the Scoffney system not work well. But it was capable of producing nice quality pictures. Um, very complicated device, and of course, it died when CRTs became uh, became common. Uh, I have a letter. Yeah, I have, I have a letter 
from uh, a guy named Tom Hall, long since dead. I, I knew Tom Hall. He was active in cable television. And uh, he, he met John Logie Baird, and he also met Isaac Schoenberg. And his comments com concerning the relative technical qualifications of either of those gentlemen are, uh, well, I'm not supposed to quote him, but he, he thinks that Schoenberg was much more talented than John Logie Baird. And Schoenberg was a guy who worked out the, the, uh, the electronic system. And he, he was in England. Uh, uh, Tom is out of England. Yeah, so I'll let you, I have a, a couple of uh, screenshot photos from a book that talked about the Iowa City Educational Station. I don't know if it's worth trying to fumble around and do a share screen or not. I'll leave that up to uh, Steve or Dave if you want to do that. Yeah, let's go ahead and do it. Okay, to go ahead and do a share screen, Dave. Yeah, go right ahead. I can figure out how to do it. Well, there you should know. be, if, if you're on a, 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 P, a computer, there's a green arrow in the middle of your bottom of your screen pointing up, says share screen. If you're on a phone or an iPad, it's somewhere else. Okay, we'll see if that's doing anything. Yep. Okay. So the W9XK was uh, the University of Iowa station, or as James pointed out, it was State University of Iowa at the time, 45-line uh, format, triple interlace. So it was kind of high-tech for the day. And so you see a station ID here. Um, you know, early on, they were doing some demonstrations and, this is from a older presentation I had done. It kind of cracked me up. The student newspaper sent a reporter for a uh, a little demonstration that was being done. And <clears throat> the article didn't have any pictures. They apparently uh, never thought to send a photographer for a demonstration of television. Kind of a shame. But anyway, on the next slide, there's a few uh, off-screen photos of you know here's what they sent here's how it was seen in that you know very crude low resolution format and you know as james had mentioned they they tried to get a number of different schools involved in you know different coursework that went out over the educational station but i could see where for a lot of it you'd need the audio description of what this was Anyway, didn't want to take a lot of time, but thought those might be of interest. I can try another uh, share screen. Um, let's see if you can pick up the right screen. Screen one, yep. Share. Um, is that coming in? Yep. Excellent. That's me and my dog, and I, I use that. That was on a Western um, a scanning disc, and I'd taken a, um, a picture on my phone and then uh, made a JPEG out of that, put it into one of those uh, converters, and then put uh, that converter into the um, uh, Daryl Hawks converter and then onto the screen. And... If you stay still, it gets it gets better to look at. The red line is an accident that I did here making the picture, but uh, you know you, you can. Uh, one of the th things talking about the uh, the Queen's Messenger, uh, when Alexanderson gave up his research on television at GE, he'd come to the conclusion that the best uh, that that TV was going to be used for was like in a if you're sending your, your video to a friend and your friend knew it was you, that you'd be able to have a conversation with him and you'd each know who you were. And mm -hmm. that he saw that that, uh, that was the last of his uh, investigations. Let me uh, cut uh, that out. I wanted to say one of the things that was also a limitation for the transmission of 
the mechanical systems was the bandwidth that the FCC would allow, which was 200 kilohertz, I believe. So, you know, you don't get a lot of video in a 200 kilohertz bandwidth using the ordinary um, modulation of the day. So that was a further limitation. And there was, I'm sure, a certain amount of politicking going on to try to get uh, some assignment for wider bandwidth before um, electronic television came along. FCC, when they uh, assigned, I think there were 100 kilohertz um, bands in, in the uh, uh, upper mid medium waves, they also assigned some experimental VHF bands. But of course, that would have re required uh, people to have VHF receivers. And uh, most of the audience was uh, amateur radio people. It was easier enough uh, to, to build a medium wave or, or even a short wave receiver. Jenkins sometimes was on the short waves. Um, but it was a little harder to build uh, VHF equipments uh, in, in, in the 1930s during the transitional period between mechanical and electronic. And there were also hybrids between electronic and mechanical at that point. And Castellani in Italy, for example, had a, a hybrid that, uh, where the CRT produced one line and they used, a, I think it was a, a scanning drum to expand the image down into a full frame. Um, the, some of the scanning drum sets and uh, some of the, real, the, the similar uh, drums, uh, similar uh, uh, inventions like that could scan uh, much higher uh, line rates. And so during the transitional period, there were all sorts of wacky things that they did uh, experimentally. For a while, there was a system up in Canada that was 180 uh, lines by, uh, by Peck uh, Peck was a, a brilliant man that, that could do uh, all sorts of different optics. And uh, he uh, advertised that he had a, a set with a 10 inch uh, image. And then because it had um, the, the, light, the light source was an automotive bulb, he could expand that. So out the back of the set, you could just pull the set away from the wall and project a two foot image on the wall. He was using a light valve to get the uh, modulation on a uh, filament bulb. Uh, so interesting stuff was going on. Well, the amateurs were pretty much out of it by that time because it was just too hard for them to make that equipment. I have a question. Um, I remember seeing um, a television demo. I think it was mechanical. Um, and it may have been the Queen's Messenger, but the thing that I recall is the transitions between scenes. They put up a checkerboard pattern. Does anybody know uh, anything about that? That was the You're man right. with the flower. That was the man with the flower in his mouth in England. Ah, okay, yeah. 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 And is there a, a, a particular reason for doing that? Is it a matter of synchronization uh, being kept during the transition or is it just uh, to signal to viewers that yeah, we're, you're still watching our signal? Uh, it was both, but you were right about the sync because they didn't have blacker than black. They could only go down to black. And of course that was the, the signal and the sync were all the same. So uh, they would that that you'd lose your your sync at that point. So um, yeah, the checkerboard seemed to be a good compromise. Interesting. Yeah. The uh, original question was, what, what would you see on a mechanical TV? And if you come to the convention, and I'm the one do demoing the mechanical stuff, bring a friend, and one of you can be on the camera, and one of them, and looking at the RCA set. And you'll see what you can recognize. It's a perfect answer for and for perfect reason to come to the convention. One thing about it uh, with mechanical TV, some of those uh, static shots for, for W9XK, uh, we're showing drawings and so forth. Um, it's you, the the, uh, the the image becomes more recognizable when you have life and it's moving. You know, when the person's moving, um, sometimes those that sends cues to the viewer. Uh, about somebody's gestures or something where you can recognize the person better. 
And I've seen several examples of people that have done conversions um, of, of uh, like quiz shows and uh, stand up uh, from modern shows. And uh, everything's recognizable as long as you have the person on camera and it's a close up or a head and shoulders at, uh, at worst. But as soon as they zoom out to show the, uh, the item behind the curtain or something like that, you can't make anything out. So basically, what was on the air to watch was kind of haphazard. It might be a school in Iowa or some neighbor who's got the camera, but there wouldn't be any formal entertainment. It was just more of a hobbyist thing, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? In Chicago, they had regular scheduled shows. They were scheduled in the newspaper. So um, most people don't know about that, but the Daily News published uh, schedules of W9XAO and W9XAP, the two Western television stations. And there were also other stations. Uh, W9XR was in Chicago, too. That was a 24-line uh, sequential, sequential scan uh, station. And I'm not sure about their programming, but Great Lakes Broadcasting owned that one, uh, Nelson Brothers. Um, and I think that's the same company that used to sell carpets in Chicago. But uh, the other stations, Western Television, was trying to commercialize television back in the uh, 1930s. And... Uh, but what made them go best bust is that they lost uh, licenses for some of the uh, for the sound broadcasting. Uh, WIBO was uh, the uh, one that associated with W9XO, and then uh, uh, RCA bought W9XAP, which was uh, associated at the time with the uh, Daily News, uh, uh, coming uh, from uh, I think it's uh, 400 West Washington. They have another address on the river uh, now, but the same building is still there. And uh, when they lost when uh, NBC and uh, when that became the, the beginnings of W9 uh, or WMAQ, uh, um, they, they were under the auspices of RCA. And of course, RCA wanted to get out of mechanical television and, and develop the uh, electronic television. So that was the end of that station. Okay. The Alice Baird also kept a regular schedule. The point being that the electronic television was really the form of the media that made this take off. It wasn't going to do it with mechanical for various reasons. So, so they were kind of interesting toys to get those sets, but not until there was the electronic form you know, well, to take off. Don't forget there there was a they were sort of a pincer operation. I think people were very high about mechanical television in 1928, but then you had the stock market crash in 1929. So it was a different uh, situation then for people that were uh, selling apples. It was a little bit hard to uh, to either to, you couldn't buy a set because you couldn't afford it. The sets were there, mm -hmm. uh, and, and if you wanted to build one, uh, you better start mowing, mowing lawns because it costs money to buy a, a Davin neon tube or an ever ready neon tube. Um, and, and put it together yourself. And only a few amateurs had the, uh, had the talent. And, and those people, uh, Jenkins and, and, and many of the others, recruited those people to be their test uh, sites, which is why Jenkins used, uh, I believe, why he used the silhouettes, because the signal would go farther and still be intelligible. He would mm -hmm. shoot 35 millimeter movies and then, uh, of the silhouette stage. And, then, and you can see this in his book and then uh, transmit it over the uh, television. So uh, you had that, and then you had RCA, and it pretty much uh, sucked up all the uh, the research people in, uh, in this country and and uh, in Europe too. Uh, and and uh, there were a few independents like Peck that I talked about earlier, <clears throat> but um, RCA kept these things under wraps and and said it invented television in 1939 at the uh, New York World's Fair, fair where uh, David Sarnoff went on camera and and uh, also uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Oh, by the way, uh, 1939 uh, was the last year of, of uh, television transmissions from the University of Iowa on mechanical television. They also were building um, an electronic station, but World War II put the kibosh on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's really great to have so many people on tonight. 
that have this detailed knowledge of mechanical television. Um, it's fascinating to hear. Would mechanical television work with Skip? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> also, I wanted to correct something I said last time. You were asking about the color mechanical television. And um, <clears throat> I was getting, I think I got the, uh, the, 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 uh, the color uh, systems wrong. Um, uh, it was Bell, Bell that was using the argon for the blue signal, blue, blue and green signals. And uh, Baird was uh, in England, was using mercury and helium for those, for that color. Of course, red was still neon. Did they actually, they didn't do color images, did they? Yes, color moving images, yeah. And also Baird, Baird had 3D and color 3D. He, 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 it was all for promotional purposes and, and uh, keeping himself in the news so he could get more venture capital because uh, he end, uh, eventually almost went broke. And then uh, Gaumont, uh, the, the giant uh, cinema uh, conglomerate, bought him out. Oh, <laughs> And you know, that was that was it was it was crazy because um, when he was uh, they they chose Baird as one of the systems to compete to see what would be the uh, eventual uh, television system for England um, versus the uh, Marconi EMI electronic system, which was essentially a reconstituted RCA. Um, and uh, the, he was his, his uh, selling point was it's going to be a, a native son, you know, Scottish, of course but Scottish English at that point versus this giant conglomerate that was related to RCA and David Sarnoff even sat, sat on the board uh, because uh, RCA owned, owned HMV, which had become part of, uh, uh, of uh, EMI. And um, it really wasn't true. It was two conglomerates. It was Gaumont versus uh, RCA, EC, uh, EMI, uh, and uh, eventually uh, Mark, Mark Marconi and, and, uh, BBC. Yeah, hey, question. Yeah, 3D the, and, what? and, uh, and, uh, yep. Which, which question? I said the, the question of, uh, oh. would it skip work? You know, brings to mind that uh, uh, really long distance uh, uh, audio uh, has distortions that, that uh, vary over uh, a time of a few seconds and uh, video over similar di distances in the same band would uh, suffer that distortion as well. And I guess it would look like varying ghosts and, uh, and varying resolution in the image. Yeah, so, the WSUI, um, they received that over a more than a 500 mile area. They could see it in Oklahoma, for example, from Iowa City. They could see it in Chicago, uh, Indiana, at Purdue. They, they were receiving it. Um, so, um, yeah, and there were distortions, but people in those days were hams, and they were happy to receive any signal. Once again, another reason why Jenkins' silhouettes were, were a, a very intelligent thing to do. People have poo-pooed that. And they said, oh, he wasn't capable of anything but silhouettes. Untrue if you've seen uh, the same system putting out uh, facsimile signals with full gray tones. He was able to do it. He was just smart enough to use the silhouettes so that the hams that were, had equipment that might have been not up to par or out of adjustment could still see that flickering image for a few moments and then send in their QSL cards, which would also give the reception reports. But as I said, the, uh, the station, um, the Schenectady station that Alex Anderson was using, people had received that all the way on the West Coast from Skip. So yeah, there, it was possible, and I'm sure there were distortions, but uh, on a good night, Maybe they did quite well, and that was an advantage of mechanical TV. They were they were worried about that when they went to uh, VHF, for example, in England, 
and they opened Alexandra Palace because it was at the highest spot in London and uh, cut off one of the, uh, the towers on Alexandra Palace and put up a, a huge antenna. They were saying, this is the best way to get coverage with uh, VHF uh, because <laughs> they were worried it wouldn't go far enough and they'd have to put up too many stations and that would be impractical, they thought. It, uh, it reminds me of the answer I give a lot of people if they're looking at an old TV or, or listening to an old radio here is that it was so much better than no TV that, that that's why people didn't object like the hams you said uh, would, would be happy to receive anything because it was a lot better than no TV. The, um, on our website, we have a page about mechanical TV DX. That is a um, um, compilation of newspaper articles about television reception um, and the BBC station was received in Australia, for instance, um, and also in Southern Africa. Um, and um, um, they, were, they, they were just received all over the place because of the frequencies they used under you know, different conditions. Uh, they traveled just thousands and thousands of miles. Now, what the picture looked like would be a different, a different thing. Alex Anderson was doing experiments with his friends, uh, Augustus Carolus in, in Germany. And also he finally sent a single signal to Australia. And, uh, but they were very simple signals that he was like just sending lines or something to see if he could get it to go clear around the world. And they would send a signal back and uh, didn't work very well. But uh, I, under the right conditions, you know, short wave can, can do amazing things. And, and same with uh, the high uh, medium waves. Even AM. I did an article yeah. for AWA on early um, mechanical television experiments. I think it was uh, shortwave and television was doing it. Uh, the reception reports, you know, as they're trying to get everything working, they're putting it on a ship for goodness sake. Um, and they had trouble getting clear pictures they could apparently get sync okay, but uh, uh, the pictures were not very good, and they were really bothered by atmospheric noise because you know they were broadcasting you know, about 1.8 megahertz frequency in the summertime, so you know atmospherics were terrible, and the descriptions that people gave of the pictures was that everybody had beards, and I think it was probably the uh, static crashes at just the right locations and and you know set the probably oscillations going in the uh, in the receiver to cause all sorts of horizontal on and of course it, I, don't, I think it was don't think it was vertical scan but which I would have thought of but apparently uh, the um, you get really bright 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 white and then really dark blacks that lasted a long time. Um, so they said people had, all the people had beards. Uh, that kind of effect could be uh, due to the uh, type of coupling used in the uh, amplifiers. The, the uh, uh, resistance couple, couple amplifiers would not have phase distortion, but uh, capacitively coupled ones could. And if you look at some of Baird's uh, early stuff that uh, that um, Don McLean recovered from the uh, discs, there's a tremendous amount of uh, phase distortion, most of which is probably from the phonograph pickup. But uh, it illustrates the uh, kind of uh, difference required between uh, equipment for television and equipment for audio because uh, uh, audio signals are quite insensitive to phase distortions and, and video definitely is not. I remember hearing about beard drawing on people in uh, mechanical television uh, images. Uh, I think 
I, if I remember right, they would result, uh, they were doing, they were talking about it uh, with uh, CBS, uh, its, its first forays into uh, uh, television in uh, New York. Um, I think it was W9XAB. Uh, and they had a big splash when they started. They started late. I think it was about 1931 or so. Uh, but uh, it, it was it was an amplifier problem that like just what you mentioned, it was it was uh, capacitively coupling with no DC restoration. I think that caused that, if I remember right, um, I, the, I'm using that, but I use horribly big uh, capacitors for the pictures that I that I generate. And I'm not doing anything with detail. I'm just looking at pictures of my hand. Um, but. It's the same situation. I'm just so happy to receive something. It, it, it's, it's the same kind of elation that I got when my first uh, um, regenerative radio worked and, and uh, radio kit worked and, and picked up uh, China one night with three transistors. So uh, it's a thrill. But yeah, that's to, to get a better, higher fidelity image, you have to be more picky. And, and that, you know, they added on things like DC restoration and gamma correction and all that stuff. And they, they're constantly talking about that in the narrowband uh, society that, that I belong to. You also mentioned about uh, 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 picking Alexander palace for uh, uh, the transmitter site because it's the highest thing uh, in London. And uh, that reminded me of uh, the test for digital television. And of course, since the government is heavily involved, the demo station had to be in Washington, D.C. And uh, their tr transmitter is up on the Hill, uh, Wisconsin Avenue, but it's not a particularly tall tower. And then to make things really worse, the um, building height restrict restrictions in DC to make sure that nobody builds higher than the Capitol Dome means that in all the densest area, the buildings are all the same height, same limit height. When you try to put a antenna down in one of those canyons, it's absolutely horrible for uh, uh, ghosting. And um, in the VHF uh, band, um, you also notice it as uh, FM multipath distortion. And uh, so when you're trying to transmit a digital signal, which has to be equalized to within an ad's eyebrow so you can find the uh, sampling times and the sampling levels and the, you know the eye diagram uh, opens up nice and wide, uh, it's really a uh, torture test for digital systems. Also, uh, a uh, related story about the digital system we uh, found um, some terrible ghosting problems in some areas of San Francisco. And uh, we had a test receiver that would plot out the ghost energy versus time and do this continuously while you're driving the test truck through the streets. And we discovered that when you cross some intersections, the reception suddenly got worse. And then when you got on the other side of the intersection, it was better. And uh, so I went through an ellipse plot uh, of the 
uh, ghost elays and uh, uh, because the uh, constant delay uh, focus is an ellipse with the transmitter at one focus and the, and the source of the ghost at the other. And it turned out that these spots that had terrible reception had a direct view of the Golden Gate Bridge. And when you plotted out the ghost delay, it sat exactly on the towers of the Golden Gate Bridge. You can't have ghosting with digital, can you? I mean, I can understand, you know, multi-path analog signals, but with digital, given this transmission or retransmission of data that you have to... Uh, RF, is RF, RF is RF. It, it doesn't matter whether you're trying to send analog or digital. If there's reflection, there's reflection. The thing about digital TV is you can't see the ghosts in the recovered signal. It either it's recovered fine or it gets so, so bad that it totally drops out. Yeah, okay. I understand that. Yeah. I was thinking that when you have these multiple paths, yeah, right. It supports radio frequency. But then how it's interpreted, you know, if you could interpret it, oh, that's ghosting. <laughs> when you saw it in the 60s, as opposed to now. But that was interesting. Thanks. What did they do about the bridge? <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened? <laughs> Look out the window. Here's your problem. Yeah. What did they do? Uh, I'm afraid uh, the authorities wouldn't uh, allow us to uh, apply TNT. I see. Okay. So how did they resolve that problem that they had that? That was interesting. Well, it, it's, oh, if, it's, if you're not getting good reception, move the antenna. So you're saying if you had a real directional, say, roof antenna, you, you might be able to to minimize the effect of, of where the ghosting is coming from. I'll just use that term. Yep. So hopefully the transmitter was away from in the right direction, the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> yeah, the, the problem occurred, of course, when people uh, attempted indoor reception with oh. private ears and they, they had multi-path from all directions that they couldn't oh. adjust out. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Thank you. Uh, another thing about Washington, D.C., we had... Uh, a demo at the um, uh, Hotel Washington, which is the one that's near nearest the White House, and it's the place where uh, all the uh, dignitaries stay. And we had to put an antenna uh, up on the roof and, and bring a lead down to the demo area. But we found that if we got anywhere near to the White House side of the roof, reception was totally uh, blotted out. So the only thing uh, we could say is there's some uh, unknown source of interference centered on the White House. <laughs> Hey, Wayne, I, I'm just curious, who, who were you working for when you were doing this testing? Uh, Zenith. Okay. And they, that could have been alien technology from the White House. So you never know. <laughs> I wanted to ask if there's uh, anything about television BX uh, on the VHF uh, from the tropospheric ducting or something like that. That's a, a big hobby with uh, analog TV. I don't know if it's continuing 
uh, with digital uh, for a while, people that were doing that were still receiving Cuba, for example, in the United States. Uh, I thought that was an interesting hobby that I don't know very much about, but was very interested in. Yeah, I've seen some people uh, doing TV, DX and digital uh, years, some years back. I haven't uh, searched for it recently. Um, and of course, the problem with digital is uh, if it's just a little too weak, you can't find it. Uh, our experimental receivers could, uh, uh, in some cases, f detect that the signal was there and tell you there was a signal, but it was uh, too dirty to uh, error correct. The um, the synchronization part of the digital TV signal uh, developed by Zenith and which may be going away uh, for ATX. Wayne? Wayne, I, I, there was some noise on the line, and I think I may have accidentally muted you. Oh, okay. Um, so what was I saying when you lost? <laughs> I, I, I was saying something about the uh, synchronization of the ATXC1 signal. Um, our experimental receivers could detect the presence of the signal when it was too dirty or weak to recover the data. And uh, it, it was a belt and suspenders uh, synchronization. It had uh, a regular uh, sync pulse at uh, the end of every data segment, which is like 200 to, or 256 bits or symbols. Uh, and 40 times a second, it also had the ghost reference signal, which was a uh, positive negative sequence that had a huge noise gain. And, um, and the reason it's in a did the design that way is because the SEC was uh, saying that priority number one was the signal to noise threshold uh, so that they could come up with a uh, legal plan to simulcast the digital and the analog without having the having them mutually interfere. So it, it was really robust. And uh, the original intention was to get a rough sync on those pulses and that a precise sync and ghost canceling reference with the positive negative sequence. Um, I don't know for sure, but our guess was that Others who were building chips based on the system information uh, found out that the positive and negative sequence was so accurate that the pulses were not needed and they just left the pulse sync totally out of the chips. Um, and in retrospect, uh, after all these years, the only weak spot in the system design was that the uh, reference sequence was only 40 times per second, which originally everybody, including our competition, thought that that would be fast enough to take care of ghosts and from moving objects. And it turns out that it's not quite 
And um, so, for example, uh, what leaves moving in a storm if the signal is coming through that tree, uh, the ATSC wand receiver will have a hard time uh, keeping in sync and not developing errors and, and blocking. Uh, so if we had known more about the real world environment, we could have uh, given up a little more data and increased the rate of uh, reference signal, but uh, that didn't happen. Were you talking just re you were either Zenith had did the original reference or whatever it was that was so robust, and that's going away and is to be replaced by some subsequent encoding technique with digital TV? I can't hear them. This time, you're correct. But this time, uh, there is not a uh, government program uh, uh, supported by uh, spectrum auctions to the cell phone companies. So it's, it's a question of uh, how quickly it might happen. And um, because uh, you know the government won't be giving out coupons for converter boxes, uh, but the, the uh, system that specs are on the books for uh, some years now, and uh, they uh, incorporate uh, new uh, error coding techniques that were not invented when uh, ATSC-1 was uh, formalized. And uh, as a reason, and they also uh, have um, incorporated uh, variable data rates and variable robustness, which uh, Zenith proposed a two-step system way back when, but the broadcasters uh, said, no, we want max data rate at, at all costs. Uh, and uh, kind of uh, shot themselves in the foot in that uh, regard, because uh, now they want to have flexible uh, use of the data for uh, 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 synchronization with uh, internet content and uh, uh, various uh, other uses besides the uh, broadcast entertainment programs. And they also would like to uh, um, uh, coordinate with cell systems so that uh, um, depending on who holds the purse strings, because the cell systems have been very re reluctant <clears throat> to do anything uh, to cooperate with the broadcasters, but the, the idea is to uh, possibly uh, seamlessly swap over between cell uh, transmission and uh, big stick uh, TV transmission when you have uh, data that's the main TV program being supplemented by uh, personalized content. It's called advertising, right? Absolutely. You also should know that uh, when you go and buy a cheap digital TV receiver these days, you are 
only paying a, a part of the cost because they're expecting you to hook up to, to the internet and uh, them to mine your viewing habits and, uh, and uh, connect you to uh, uh, internet services on your smart TV, which is an inlet to your home for uh, personalized ads. <laughs> I see. Couldn't do that with analog, could you? Nope. Um, Wayne, I heard a uh, presentation a year or so ago that some of the, the next phase in uh, digital TV is going to do things like allow the emergency broadcast alerts that you get to be actually targeted to uh to like maybe your street or to uh you know to to really uh make it more of a two-way thing uh to to addresses pr and probably down the road advertising that's uh targeted to, to certain specific people or areas or groups uh so is that the kind of thing you're talking about yes Yes, and also uh, a uh, way to carry uh, uh, government uh, communications to uh, police and fire departments and, uh, and to provide a robust backup to uh, uh, services that are using the cell systems right now because uh, the experience in uh, large-scale disasters is uh, has been that a lot of the times the uh, broadcast stations manage to stay on the air where the cell uh, towers go down. Guys, I have to drop off now, but some of this was really great. And James, uh, thank you for that uh, information about Iowa State versus University of Iowa that I, I'd get, been getting wrong for a long time. So thanks a lot for that. You're welcome. Thanks, guys. Bye.